Hello, welcome. It is so wonderful to be here with two of my favorite political theorists who I also have the, the good fortune and privilege of, of calling my friends. We came up through the ranks together um, as lowly graduate students and now somehow by some uh, miracle, we all have jobs. <laughs> So for, um, now. I, for now, <laughs> for now, <laughs> yeah, you can you can never really uh, yeah. rest rest on your laurels. <laughs> um, yeah, so so um, Brianna McGinnis, assistant professor of political science at the College of Charleston, and Nolan Bennett, assistant professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, where I'm told it's two degrees today. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Nolan, for for you know just surviving. <laughs> That's here. that's shorts weather. That's shorts <laughs> weather, really. <laughs> well, we're here today to talk about John Locke. Um, we all teach, you know, kind of introductory courses in political thought, and John Locke is a character that turns up on all of our syllabi in various capacities. So I thought it would be kind of cool to to get us all together and to just kind of talk about our experiences with. John Locke. So my, my first question, right, whenever you teach John Locke as a political theorist, he, he usually comes just after another big hitter in the history of political thought, Thomas Hobbes, right? Um, so I have to ask you, because this is the question that all my students are probably going to be asking me and asking themselves, Team Hobbes or Team Locke? I mean, I feel this one first. If, if, uh, easily, easily, I'm going to say lock. Yeah. Easily. Um, uh, just in terms of, you know, all around enjoying, you know, enjoying reading, teaching, arguing with, thinking about. I love me some Tommy Hobbs also. I like Hobbs a lot. Uh, but, but always going to most enjoy reading and teaching lock. It gets harder if it's like, Locke or Rousseau or someone else, like the next person, then I start to kind of go, oh, I don't really know. But yeah, no, I'm going to say team, team Locke. All right. So Nolan with an unequivocal team mm -hmm. Locke. Yeah. How about you? Well, Professor Nolan, Magettis? I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> um, so I, <laughs> this is I why we've been brought here. Love, yes. I love reading Hobbes, right? So in part, it's, it's the fun of reading them. So I think like to the to the newcomer, obviously to our students, this probably all seems about equally tedious. <laughs> but like they're wrong. Like I don't often tell my students that their interpretations are just wrong. But when they say law or that Hobbes is boring, they're wrong. Hobbes is funny. He is like lobbing bombs. He's picking fights with everybody. Um, I think yeah. So I think Hobbes is like fun to read in terms of just sort of like the the joy, but also the violence is really explicit in Hobbes. Whereas I think. Locke tries to kind of sugarcoat it. Mm. Um, and so while well, that gives us a lot to wrestle with in Locke, um, I think I think ultimately Hobbes and Locke are a lot more alike than they are different. But, mm -hmm. but Hobbes just puts it really right out there. Mm. Hobbes hates everybody. I, I will concede that Leviathan is a more fun cover to cover read than the two treatises. <laughs> I will concede. <laughs> And, yeah, so again, Hobbes has the better trade. cover. If you're in an introductory, if you're in an introductory course, you've probably not been punished to read either the first treatise or the opening chapters of Leviathan. Yeah. But you know that in terms of that, in terms of overall works, I'm still going to go with Locke. But but just like a book, you got to bring with you to the beach. You know? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll give it to Leviathan. Well, I, you know. I'm kind of torn. I think that uh, six months ago, I would have told you Team Locke, maybe not as unequivocally as, as Professor Bennett, but you know, these days, I think I'm, I'm Team Hobbes. There's something, to kind of echo what, what Professor McGinnis was saying, there's something about how Hobbes just unmasks the, the violence at the foundation. Or, you, you know, like, um, like I think of the his discussion of the family, the kind of origins of the family. And it's just the origins of the patriarchal family are in kind of the domination of, of women by men, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, later feminist political theorists like Carol Pateman will take this and kind of run with it in a very critical way. So yeah, there, there's something about um, how, how hard Hobbes presses this idea of the kind of artificiality and the, convincial, the convinciality of, of politics. 
that um, I, I find really appealing. And then I also find, you know, in these days, we're living in this moment in, in the United States, all of us are in the US of kind of great civil strife. Um, and I find myself, I think, longing for peace and stability in the maybe like pathological way that Hobbes <laughs> longs for it. <in> this <laughs> Where is the God. sovereign? Come say yeah, this, come please. sort this right, yeah. out. <laughs> you know? All right, so cool. All right, we know where we all stand. So now I'll, I'll follow up. You know, you're teaching Locke. What's what's your favorite part of the second treatise, which is of course the the text that that most of us are all going to be teaching in these classes. What's your favorite part to teach? And then what's the part of the text that you think students most sort of respond to? Would you care to go first, Professor? No, Hannah? please. I want I okay. want a chance. I want a chance to unequivocally reject and no, I'm kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be curious to hear hear your thoughts first, because I and also I'm stalling for time. I'm okay, not cool. sure which is my favorite. <laughs> okay, so so I teach. Okay, I engage with Locke primarily through my teaching these days. Like there was a point when I think I, you know, wrote a lot more about Locke. You know, um, I it, when I was in like graduate school, but I mostly teach him now, and I teach at the College of Charleston. So Charleston is in, mm. you know, the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting, I'm talking to you from between the Ashley and the Cooper Rivers, which are named after Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper or Lord Shaftesbury, right? So one of these like Lords proprietor of the Carolinas. So like we have a particular relationship with Locke here um, that, that I like to draw out for my students. And so, you know, I know we'll, we'll talk about Locke on slavery in a moment, but I really like to teach um, his chapter three from the second treatise um, in my classes. So I teach classes like intro to political theory and then also a class called democracy and discipline where we talk about punishment, right? As being this basic fundamental activity of the sovereign. So if, if I seem a bit obsessed with violence, I apologize, but, um, but you know, all of this waves hands. So I really like to teach chapter three because there is so much to unpack there. Um, and it all sort of seems really straightforward until you come up against this kill a thief line. And then there's this kind of record scratch moment where students are like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm following this. You know, like the, the rights forfeiture theory of punishment, this makes intuitive sense to us. Wait, what? Right, like this is not proportional, the, the killing a thief part. So I really enjoyed that part. And then there's also all this lovely rhetoric about, you know, also killing a wolf or a lion. Um, so I, I enjoy that, you know, for my, my own research, but also I think that's a really fun part to teach. And it speaks to the point you made earlier, kind of in passing, but I think is really insightful that maybe Hobbes and Locke aren't all that different. Maybe there isn't mm -hmm. all that much space because, yeah, I mean, you know, Hobbes makes a very similar point that if, if somebody would steal your purse, you know, they would take mm -hmm. your life. And so you're justified um, in retaliating with, you know, kind of escalating the, the violence. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nolan, how about you? I, I, so first I have to agree, that is an awesome part of the, the second treatise that before I started working more on prisons and punishment stuff, I glossed over a little bit, but since then have come to love teaching. And similarly, like you said, uh, the, the kind of like students following along and then suddenly being like, wait, hold on, like this, certainly this seems too rash. But especially given familiarity today that students have with like the castle doctrine or conversations mm -hmm. around uh, the, the use of violence on your own property, I think that's a really fun section to teach. My overall favorite section has to be still chapter five on property, which, which, is, which is probably a kind of classic cliche thing to say. But I think that in teaching, you know, first off, one of the reasons I like teaching Locke to at least students who are American in some capacity, regardless of citizenship status, is that it's kind of stuff you already know because it's kind of in your political, cultural DNA somewhere deep down. You maybe haven't really thought about it, recognized before, but it's there. And that can be difficult, as we all know, because that means at first you read it and you kind of go, well, duh, I already know this. Or like, this isn't very interesting. Why is everything in such weird old timey language to say what we already know? And it's really fun to discover, like actually a lot of this while borrowing from earlier thinkers was pretty revolutionary and radical at the time. But I think property and what defines property is something that most of us haven't really thought about that much 
when we're first taking an introduction to political theory class. We have probably worked. Hopefully we have some conception of labor and our relation to labor and wages and things, but maybe we haven't really thought about property and its connection to politics, freedom, and government. And for that reason, I just love working through that section. I teach Locke in a couple of different contexts, one of which is an American political thought class. So that also sets up like a beautiful kind of alley-oop, not only, of course, American revolutionary conversations around uh, taxes and, the, the, and, and the taking property without consent, but anti-slavery writers like Frederick Douglass or, or anti-racist writers who similarly look to making property truly equitable and free to all. I, I just think it sets it up in all sorts of fun ways. The last thing, and I know we're going to get to this, is there are a lot of really weird problems in the chapter on property. That's a reductive way of saying this. There's a lot of really weird problems. <laughs> and it's really fun teaching conscientious, thoughtful students who already see those immediately upon reading that chapter. Like, well, hold on. How could there be enough of the world left in common to others in an age of diminishing resources? Well, hold on, you know, um, how can we acquire things that don't spoil if like we have currency and credit cards and inherited wealth? So for all those reasons, I really like teaching that chapter. There, I'm thinking of, hold on, what's going on in this turfs passage, right? Yes. <laughs> the turfs my servant has cut. <laughs> They should belong to the servant, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Excellent. So we've already sort of gotten there because um, you all are awesome. Um, but one of the things I, I want to talk about is, uh, you know, Locke's biography. Um, so, you know, Locke, you know, lived in England and I think for a time in the Netherlands when it was kind of tough to be a Protestant center <laughs> plotting revolution in England. Um, in the 17th century. So his, his work is often interpreted in terms of the struggle between, you know, the crown and the parliament from, you know, the kind of days of the English Civil War and Oliver Cromwell and those characters to the Glorious Revolution of 1688 when, you know, so the kind of Whig history goes, the absolutist monarch is overthrown and the good Protestant, you know, Mary, Queen of Scots and her husband, William, ascend to the, to the throne, or, and now we have a constitutional monarchy, whatever, you know, that's sort of like the, the context, um, you know, that, that a lot of people read Locke, and I, I'm guilty of this, I'm making my students, I'm inflicting on them some like BBC <laughs> audio documentaries, which very much embed Locke in this context, but as both of you all have already, you know, pointed us toward, right, there's this kind of interesting American context in which to read and think about Locke. So he was the secretary to this Earl of Shaftesbury that everything in Charleston is named after, apparently. <laughs> um, he was the chancellor of the Exchequer, and he assisted in drafting the fundamental constitutions of Carolina. And, you know, he was secretary to the uh, Council of Trade and Plantations, a member of the Board of Trade, right? He's like involved in the new world, quote unquote, in all these ways. So my question is, what in your view are the kind of implications of these biographical details about Hobbes for his political theory? I think that Locke is like, he is a great um, cautionary tale um, regarding mm -hmm. political theorists or political thinkers generally getting close to power. Um, and the kinds of incentives that get set up and the kinds of conflicts with your principles that might get set up. Um, so I, I mean, I don't have any sort of like easy answers in terms of how to approach Locke when he has this stain, you know, in his reputation. Um, but we do, like, so when I teach Locke, we talk through at least part of the fundamental constitutions of Carolina, because we're in Carolina. Um, and, um, and you know, I discussed this with my my students, but I think there's a lot for us to, to take away from this, right? And I think, you know, on the one hand, it's a good opportunity to talk about how to read texts with students, mm -hmm. right? Like, do you read it sort of like within its own um, content or, you know, within a longer historical um, tradition or within like the context of its time? Um, but I think like, yeah, there are like real tensions there, right? Just the same way as, you know, Benjamin Constant began to waffle on things like exiling his enemies when he got a little bit closer to power, you know, from Napoleon Bonaparte, 
I think you see some like real compromises made on Locke's mm -hmm. part. And I think that this, like when students read this, they are rightfully skeptical um, of how sincerely they should read Locke when they run into these, these snarls. Uh, I'll, I'll just add, I mean, you know, what I can there. I, I think that this Locke for the reasons you've both nicely laid out is a really nice introduction to the various ways we try to think about the relationship between ideas and the thinkers who thought them and the context in which they were thinking and writing. We are accustomed to doing that all the time in, in our contemporary lives. We think about, uh, you know, claims of hypocrisy or we think of, you know, backgrounds that come out about prominent cultural or political leaders today and whether we you know, uh, can kind of accommodate those or, or, or you know, what have you, right? Um, but of course, uh, one of the weirdest things when you first start reading political theory is there can be kind of a, a, a like a, a disconnection that sometimes happens. You start talking about all these traditionally dead white dudes as though they were not historical people and as, and as though they were not individual people with, with lives, desires, passions, and so on. Um, and so I think knowing that context, unsavory as some of it is, is a really important precursor to asking questions about, well, then what does that mean for the descriptions of property that you find within his treatises, right? Um, of course, the, the question here is not only Locke's relationship to slavery, uh, but in a broader sense, colonialism and the dispossession of indigenous life. So, you know, other quotes that sometimes jump out for first readers are, you know, in the beginning, all was America. Or when he talks about the uncultivated wastes of America, void of civilized life. And fortunately today now, given better education, you know, we as students kind of go, wait, hold on. We know there were actually <laughs> lots of inhabitants uh, in, in the US. They were right? mixing their labor with all <laughs> kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and the thing now, you know, I like to always tell my students, we know now is that many indigenous cultures in the US had forms of agriculture that were far superior to what we think of as predominantly European. And that the story of Jamestown is really that they were just too <laughs> selfish and big headed that they almost die in their first winter until they learn how to grow corn from indigenous people, right? Um, but again, you know, these all encourage us to think really critically, not, I don't think to say then, well, because Locke was involved in these things, we can't find use or value in his in his writings or readings, um, much for the same reason that we now know upon reading Thomas Jefferson, we all know he was a slave owner and 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 worse than that. Um, but but we still read his ideas and think critically about them. So that that's one of the I mean, that's a more general point. But this is why I like already thinking about Locke's context, you know, and maybe back to the, you know, to defend Locke a little bit more. Maybe that's a reason why it's kind of fun that some of those things are a little hidden in his writing, because we have to do the work to kind of pull in some of those historical contexts. Excellent. All right, last question. Um, this is my more sophisticated phrasing of a question that I'm sure is often put to all of us by our students. Why the hell should I read this? Why bother? This book is so old and so inscrutable and addressing sort of a political context that is so foreign from my own, et cetera, et cetera. Why do I have to read Locke? Does Locke have any sort of relevance or, or, or use for us today? I think this has already been touched on in terms of it being like part of the um, American political culture's DNA. And I know that it's kind of a, like, a cliche to say that about Locke, but it's true. Um, and so I know there's this like conventional wisdom that the social contract has largely been abandoned, but like we use it all the time still, right? It kind of like rears its ugly head in um, discussions of punishment or undocumented immigration. So I think that, that knowing Locke and seeing his arguments because his arguments are sophisticated and you can't just dismiss them. Um, I think that, that going through that process with Locke is really useful. Um, and the fact that it does seem a little bit separate from our current political milieu is useful because then we can sort of take a step back and assess it critically. But a lot of those things that we're seeing in Locke do apply still. Yeah, I, I would add to that, 
I think there's a way of reading Locke, maybe despite him, but in a more radical tradition that connects Locke to, of course, the right to resistance, but more broadly, the politics of civil disobedience and protests mm -hmm. to labor politics in the US. The fact that the ideas of Karl Marx do take root in the US among many movements from anarchists to communists and, and, and so on. Um, but that you don't have a robust tradition of Marxist politics in the US in, in any way like you do in parts of Latin and Central America or Europe or, or Asia or elsewhere. And often you find instead it is Locke's conceptions of freedom and its connection to property and the acquisition of property that become these really robust tools for people thinking about, well, why, why might something like freedom to a wage not be enough? Why might we need um, more robust forms of freedom that have to do that 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 are that involve you kind of seeing yourself in the labor that you do, and it's being individualizing in a way that's not isolating, but putting you in community with others. Uh, some of that I think you have to read a little against Locke, but certainly there are political activists and thinkers from the 19th century up to today, and. I focus on the U.S. because that's where my research is, but elsewhere too, I think that would find in, in, in Locke a lot of really helpful I, ideas, as well as a whole discussion about freedom that is so much more robust and interesting and complicated than just, you know, oh, mask mandates take away my freedom. No public health orders give me, my, you know, the, the kind of reductive way sometimes it gets portrayed in contemporary politics. Um, yeah, no, I, I just a thousand percent co-sign like there are some pretty radical roads out of Locke. Um, maybe they're, they're roads that Locke himself did not take or, or would not have approved of. But, you know, that's that's one of the great things to me about studying the history of political thought is you, you could torture it to make it say what you want. To <laughs> Back to Hobbes. Yeah. <laughs> no, so like I'm thinking of, right, um, I'm thinking of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, you know, kind of famous essay in the Atlantic, um, his his defense of reparations or his argument for reparations, the case for reparations, I think mm -hmm. is the title. He opens that with a quote from the second treatise, right? Yeah. Uh, about, you know, it's this discussion of punishment that Brianna, you were referring to earlier, but there's also a right to seek reparation, um, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, so, you know, or, you know, maybe, <laughs> You know, maybe we all, you know, we're all like, you know, whatever, like lefty political theory professors, right? So we all love Ta-Nehisi Coates, but, you know, a, a less comfortable, but I think also radical route out of Locke. We saw on the steps of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, right? They were waving appeal to heaven flags, mm. right? Um, and what I think is ultimately a real distortion and perversion of Locke's ideas about the right of resistance, right? <laughs> You're going to have to convince me of the long train of, you know, abuses and usurpations that, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that QAnon is, you know, on about. Um, but, you know, there, there, there's the Lockean legacy kind of right in our face. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is stuff that we're, we're just fated to grapple with as Americans, um, whether mm -hmm. we like it or not. So we may as well read the guy. <laughs> and we don't. <laughs> as a nation. <laughs> Locke, well, we may as well read the guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most wholehearted endorsement. Why not? <laughs> Oh, man. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to be with me. And it's, it just feels so good to, to laugh with, with you all, honestly. Oh, this is so fun. And as your yeah, students probably fun. already know, we could keep doing this for absolute hours. So it takes incredible willpower on all our behalf to just kind of hold back. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next week. So for... <laughs> Part two right. of an 80 part series. <laughs> All right, I'm going to, to have mercy on my students and cut us off here, but but thank you seriously from the bottom of my heart. Thank, thank you. you. That's fun.